So maybe before you start, Ian, I just wanted to uh, welcome Dennis to the group. Um, uh, the, the I assume you kind of have the the gist of what this group is, but it's um, to give a brief overview. It's about supporting the Chicago film industry primarily, but also kind of the immersive content meet, like market as that as that unfolds, and and really just kind of help train people and give them access to resources and networking um, of other people in the area that are also kind of into this whole, whatever you want to call it, immersive content, uh, uh, virtual production. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that do VR, um, 360, and then, and people interested in all sorts of different kinds of virtualization workflows. So, um, so hopefully you find this group informative and welcoming and thanks for showing and joining us. And Tony, again, so your second meeting, um, John, I believe this is your second or third meeting. So yeah, welcome guys. Welcome back again. And yeah. So with that, um, meeting 35, I think. 36. <laughs> 36, meeting 36 of CVP. All right. Um, I guess just to quickly introduce uh, myself. Um, my name is Ian Norman. I'm a photographer and uh, now photographer turns video game developer, I suppose. Um, so uh, I guess uh, maybe a year and a half ago, I uh, decided I wanted to start one of my like lifelong dreams of making a video game. So I downloaded Unreal Engine, uh, played around with that for a little while, uh, built myself a computer so I could run it. And um, so I've been using that for the last uh, almost two years, I guess. And um, I'm sort of like approaching it from a standpoint of like not necessarily being a software developer, um, but having kind of a love for all things visual and, you know, like uh, both like graphic design and, and uh, you know, like just, just the stuff that kind of comes along with photography. And Unreal Engine is just a really, really cool tool to be able to make uh, photorealistic scenes in 3D uh, that can be used in video games or in this case, uh, virtual production. Um, the, what I'm gonna be showing you guys, uh, we're gonna make a scene hopefully to, uh, that, that would be able to work in, in like a virtual production setting uh, just fine. Um, and uh, we're gonna do it with like some relatively uh, simple techniques, I suppose. Um, I've tried to kind of learn the workflow in Unreal such, you know, from the approach of a beginner. And uh, I tried to make, you know, this demo um, relatively friendly. So hopefully it should be pretty straightforward for you guys. Um, so, you know, as I go, if you guys run into any issues, just, just, just ask. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so you guys can see. Um, Kind of show you what I was what I was working on, and then we'll jump into the the actual demo here. All right, so um, hopefully you guys can see this. Can you see my entire screen, uh, everyone? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, this is Gaia. Um, it's a free piece of software. I found it to be kind of the best new procedural landscape generator um, out there. Um, it seems like it's being constantly updated uh, by the developers. And um, so th they're like always adding like new features and there seems to be quite a bit of uh, material online for learning it as well. And that seems to be growing as well. Um, but I also found it to be one of the easier to use ones. So um, this is a landscape that I've been working on. Um, and it was sort of inspired by um, the wallpaper that I have on my new Mac computer, which is, is this photograph here. Um, and so this is like the California coast. This is the Bixby Bridge uh, on, on Highway 1 in California. And, uh, you know, you've got some sea cliffs and uh, just these really cool uh, looking you know, kind of grassy covered mountains. And so I, I looked at that as my sort of inspiration. 
And um, this is what I came up with in Gaia. And so kind of gives you an idea, you know, you, you do have like quite a bit of control over what you can do um, with it. And uh, so, so this is a terrain that I made with um, a bunch of steps, which you can kind of see down in this bottom section here. Um, and uh, it's a matter of just kind of doing a bunch of primitive uh, uh, nodes. And I'll, I'll show you what that means in a, in a minute. And, uh, and it's just sort of like combining a couple things together, adding some erosion in there, and it, it kind of does it itself. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting program. Um, and uh, I add some, added some terraces so that we get uh, these sort of sea cliffs in there. Um, and then just some, some like color to represent the depth of the, of the ocean. Um, so yeah, so that is uh, a terrain that I'm currently working on uh, in Gaia. And I'm, right now I'm in the state of like trying to figure out how to bring it into Unreal um, in a way that sort of uh, gets the result that I want. So finding the textures and materials that I wanna use. Um, so that's what I'm working on uh, currently. So anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this. Don't need to save this because I already saved it earlier. And um, let's open up that Unreal project. So I have that open right now. Um, and this is a scene that I made um, in a few hours uh, specifically for this demo. And it's using entirely free assets. So um, in addition to obviously Unreal Engine being free, everything you see in here, like the rocks and the trees, uh, the clouds, all that stuff is, uh, all the materials like on the landscape and everything, um, they're all available for free on the Unreal Marketplace. Um, and I think that this is like an important thing to keep in mind, like there's a lot that you can do with Unreal Engine without having to pay a dime. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just really cool. That you, there's all these things available that you can, can start off on uh, pretty quickly. So just to give you a summary of what I'm using. Um, so oh, just, Unreal Engine just, has... Sorry, Ian, just, yeah. um, one, just one, also just one note about Unreal Engine licensing is that there, there is like a point where you do have to start paying for it, but I think it's several hundred thousand dollars or like a million dollars worth of it's a million dollars a million dollars worth of, of gross revenue or something yeah 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 so their publisher's license which is basically if you're going to create a program or like a game or something like that um and and redistribute it then yeah i think you once you reach a hundred or once you reach a million dollars of revenue um you have to pay, start paying uh epic games a portion of your revenue. I, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but it, it's, it's all pretty reasonable, um, I think, especially for such a cool tool. Um, so these are the assets that I'm using. I'll just step through them real quick, just so you guys can know um, kind of like what's available in the marketplace. Um, there's some really great stuff from Project Nature um, that this publisher has made um, just tons of like foliage, you know, trees and bushes and grass and stuff like that to implement into your, you know, outdoor scenes. So we're using one called Optimized Grass Library and the project files that you guys downloaded have um, a portion of this uh, asset set in it. So I, I didn't include everything in it. It's mostly there, but um, just for the sake of not everybody not having to download like 30 gigs of files, I, uh, uh, I sort of pared it down. Um, so that's the first thing that I'm using. The next one is the Quixel Megascans dry grass collection. This is where the rocks and the dry grass comes from. Um, this is a really cool asset pack as well. Quixel makes um, really cool photogrammetry scans of stuff. And um, so I'm using a few assets from there. Um, the next one, is, this one's new, just like literally this last week. Um, it was uh, released, I think, uh, and it's the Megascans trees. So um, they've made what I think are probably the best looking trees um, that you can find on the marketplace currently. Um, and uh, yeah, completely free uh, European black alder trees. So, uh, and then I also have uh, this like water materials 
uh, thing that's available for free on the marketplace as well. Um, I use that in the background on some of the different views in the scene, um, which uh, maybe I can show you here. So um, when you're in Unreal, if you just kind of click into the view port and you hit uh, the number one, you can see uh, different view, you know, like different views hit the number two and here's another view. Um, here you can see the ocean in the background that I have some of that water material. If you hit three, that's the original um, view that, that I showed. Uh, four, there's another view here and you can see um, there's also some water over in the, in the far left uh, corner there. Um, so yeah, I have four different view um, camera views that I set up for uh, this particular scene. And uh, yeah, anyway, so let's, uh, let's try to get, uh, get started. Um, when we think about Unreal, um, we have to sort of think of it as being kind of like this, uh, this like master world creation tool, right? Or, or like the world assembly tool, I think is maybe a better uh, way to, to, to think about it. Um, most of the assets that you're going to have in Unreal are going to be, have been built in another program uh, like Blender, you know, like a 3D modeling program um, or uh, perhaps a photogrammetry, photogrammetry program like uh, capturing reality or um, what's that other one, Scott, uh, that you have a license to? Uh, that one's called uh, Mega, uh, Metashape. Yeah, Adishot, Soft Metashape or whatever. Um, so uh, once those assets are built, we can use Unreal Engine to sort of bring them all together into a final scene, whether that's for a video game or virtual production. Um, so I like, sort of like to think of it as like playing God, you know, like assembling the world, um, which is uh, it's a pretty fun way to think about it. And even like the way that it, things are built, it's sort of like, it's like having your own version of Genesis or something like that, like you're, you know, let there be light and there was light kind of thing. So uh, let's go ahead and, and we'll, we'll start it in Gaia um, to try and create a scene like this and, uh, and then we'll pull it into Unreal. So um, I'd like for you guys to keep Unreal Engine open. Um, if possible, that'll just keep everything, uh, keep all the stuff in memory. And then um, let's open up Gaia and um, if you guys go to open projects and uh, look for the CVP landscape demo folder that uh, you uh, downloaded for uh, this demo, if you open that up, oh, wait a moment here. Is that right? Hold up. Actually, don't know if I have that content in there or not. All right, we're gonna. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start it from scratch. I think I thought that I included my Gaia thing in there as well, but I might be wrong. Does anybody else? Is it this? Gaia demo terrain? Yeah, I've got uh, underscore CVP Island. Uh, yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah. CVP yeah, Island dot. I don't, know why I, don't, I don't know why I don't have that on mine. Um, yeah, I've got it. I feel like I moved yeah, it or I something. I also have it under, <laughs> so like underneath the main folder. Underneath the main, yeah, the underneath the, the main folder. That's funny. Yeah, like, like you've got content and then you've got get Gaia demo terrain. Yeah, OK. Um, well, if you guys could open up the .tor file, um, let me see if this, let me see if this, uh, is what we're looking for. Yeah. If you could open up this, the CVP Island, uh, dot TOR file, that should, should give us, give us what we need. Um, yours probably look a little bit different than this. Um, let me see. There was another one here. Mm 
<clears throat> okay, here we are. That's the right one. That looks Found like it. One I have. Okay, so um, just to give you a guys, guys, like a quick overview of what um, this interface is like. So you've got your 3D viewport in the top. Um, I think by default, the control is if you hold down option, or I'm sorry, alt on, uh, on PC, and then you uh, click and drag your mouse, you can rotate the viewport. Um, can everybody confirm that that's what there's a setup like? I, I actually changed that. You can change that in the preferences. So if you go to Gaia um, preferences, you can, you can modify how that works. Uh, you can change the rotate pan and uh, you know, sensitivities and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, alt mouse, uh, left mouse is the main rotate. And then you can use your uh, uh, middle mouse scroll to zoom in and out. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward, um, pretty easy. And over on the right hand side here, there's the uh, 2D viewport that you can bring up to have like a fully top down view of your map. Um, so pretty straightforward. Um, the area down below, this is sort of like the node uh, graph editor. And this is where we actually create our terrain. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of step through how this terrain was created, and then we'll create one from scratch real quick. So if I click on uh, the very first node there that says mountain, we can see here that we have uh, what Gaia creates as like a primitive mountain. So um, this is basically created with noise. Um, it does some random noise generation, and then it uses that noise, and then it uh, turns that into a height map and then displays it in 3D for us. Um, so this is what it uses as sort of like a basic uh, basic mountain. And one of the cool things about it is, uh, let me see if I can move any of you guys out of the way here. Um, you can adjust your, uh, your settings for this mountain. Um, and you guys can go ahead and like select that and just like kind of mess around with uh, any one of these uh, settings, scale, uh, the edge size, or even the seed, and it will completely change the look of that mountain. If you change the seed, you'll get a completely new randomly generated mountain, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, completely brand new thing that's basically, uh, you know, your, your base for uh, uh, terrain. I think it's easy to start off um, by building an island. So that's kind of what I did for the demo. And um, that's for a few reasons. For one, it's really easy to have a horizon that just kind of goes out to the ocean and doesn't have anything in it. Um, uh, of course, there's ways to make you know larger landscapes and stuff like that. But I think an island is like a really good demo. So from uh, the mountain node, I added an erosion node. So if we click on that, this is one of the more um, taxing nodes in terms of computational power. Um, it can take some time depending on your computer to render, but erosion is kind of like the, the, the magic of any given terrain generator. Um, and Gaia gives you a whole bunch of different options here um, in terms of like what it's doing uh, to the noise and uh, or, you know, to, to the terrain that you're feeding into it. And you can mess around with these uh, for days to, to get any given uh, look. So like, for example, if I like increase the rock softness um, and I hit apply changes uh, down on the bottom, um, you can see that it starts to cut into the rock a little bit more. So we can increase the duration and the strength and then hit apply as well. And we can see how it transforms the, the landscape. There we go. So that's uh, pretty interesting looking. So this kind of like reminds me a little bit more of like, a, something you'd see like, I don't know, in like an Arizona desert or something kind of like, I don't know, um, uh, ship rock or something like that. I don't know, pretty, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, you, you sort of have kind of these, like all these different parameters that you can use to, to, to modify the terrain. Um, so obviously the, the landscape that I'm creating right now, um, it's a modification of what I had before um, so it'll end up being something completely new. Go ahead and undo that really heavy uh, erosion thing. Okay, so then the next step um, here, this is the lakes node. Um, this is just kind of like an easy way to do water, uh, to represent water in your landscape. 
Um, yeah, it's a good way to create like a mask of like where you would put your water. Um, and, uh, you know, so in this case, since we have just a mountain in the center of our landscape, it turns it into an island, which kind of makes sense. And uh, you, you can adjust the precipitation level. So like how, how deep do you want the water uh, to be? Every time you change one of these uh, nodes uh, after the primitives, you have to hit apply changes down at the bottom to see the, the change. Um, so, you know, I can adjust the precipitation and, and kind of get, uh, get the level that I want um, for, uh, for our particular island. So yeah, I don't know, that's looking pretty good. And uh, so that's, that's, that's it right there. It's like three nodes to create an island, right? Like that's the basic, you know, work that you need to put into Gaia. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and there's a, there's a million things that you can do. Um, if you look over on the, uh, on the left side of the, the graph editor, you can see the toolbox for all of the different nodes that you can use. And to use these nodes, you can just drag and drop them um, into your uh, into your graph. So, um, for example, we started off with mountain. They're calling that a geo primitive. Um, they also have um, other kind of even more primitive primitives, which are like basic noise generators. So, um, for example, I could just drag in this Perlin noise and uh, see what that looks like. So this is what um, like a raw Perlin noise looks like in, uh, you know, turned into a height map. So you could imagine um, this is the same, essentially the same thing as if you went into Photoshop. I don't know if you guys are familiar and you use the, the clouds filter. It generates what's basically Perlin noise um, and, uh, you know, turn that into a height map. And this is kind of what you get. It just looks like kind of like a rocky terrain. Um, and if you applied erosion to that, so using that, that, uh, that node here, I can just drag off from the output, I can drag off into empty space and, and let go of my mouse button. And I'll just type in erosion. And it brings up the search here. And there's the erosion node that it attaches to it. And then we have kind of the same, uh, the same process that it's going through. So I can increase the duration, maybe make the rock softness a little bit higher. And now we have like a really kind of like craggy looking, almost desert-like uh, terrain. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So you could sort of imagine, I don't know, I could imagine this being in Arizona or something, Get some cacti down in these smooth areas, whatever, you know, <laughs> pretty simple. So that's just two nodes, really simple to create a landscape. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that gives you kind of like a real brief, brief like overview. You could do a million things like dragging multiple nodes in and combining them together, uh, multiple states of erosion. Um, it, 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 it's really interesting, like just pulling these things in and dragging nodes together um, just to see what they'll do. And uh, there's usually there's like a little description on each one. If you kind of highlight it and read the tooltip, it'll uh, explain what it does. And for the most part, you can work from the top down. So you would start with your primitives and geo primitives, and then you'd sort of modify them with these warps and adjustments. Uh, and then later on in your graph, you would add things like filters, erosion. Uh, and then as you get into um, things like they have like snow, water, uh, and then these data nodes down here, these are all mostly for colorization later on. So turning that uh, that landscape into something that looks a little bit more than just like a, a gray, you know, moon, moonscape, if you will. So, um, I'm going to actually delete these two nodes that, uh, can I ask a, can I, I ask a question real quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So does it naturally populate that in terms of sort of large brush strokes down to fine detail things? So you, so it's intuitive to start working big scale and then tweaking things small scale. Uh, yeah. So, um, usually on like the primitives, um, there is like this scale slider. So if you wanted to create um, what would be like a smaller hill, um, you would want to drag that scale down. And um, that'll create a feature that is, you know, like maybe a little bit more extreme, I suppose. And then if you were to drag that scale up, then you could create a much larger landscape and something more on the uh, more akin to like a mountain range. Um, so, you know, that kind of gives you an idea. So it, it, it looks like it flattens it out, but it, it, the idea being that, you know, 
the larger you zoom out in a, in a sense, the smaller things look, right? Um, yeah, so, but I was even speaking more to like the toolbox. The toolbox kind of starts from big to small. Is that kind of how you're, um, you're dragging things in or is it just sort of- Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that's a good way to, to, to look at it. Yeah, yeah. So from the top down, yeah, is sort of the, the big to small features. Um, that's a really good way to look at it, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna um, delete these nodes. You can select these. There's um, this little delete nodes button or you can hit delete. Um, Okay, so um, we have our uh, randomly generated. Uh, this is, of course, going to change since I uh, since I changed my node. Um, but here's our randomly generated uh, island, and uh, there's a couple things that I did to it to sort of like texture it and give it some uh, I don't know more life. One of them is a rock map node. So I dragged off a rock map node, and this one sort of it. It's a it's basically a mask, and it, it this one particular one it looks for um, like crevices, and it it kind of darkens the crevices, and then makes it, makes everything else white. Um, so this is like one way to texture a landscape, and then another one is just the texture node. Um, so I, I dragged the texture node in there from the same like kind of base lakes node, and uh, this one kind of works in 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 a in a different way to to just create texture, and you can modify like what you know what it's doing over in the parameters just kind of tweak it around a little bit or come up with something a little bit more random um it doesn't really matter uh exactly what you're doing there's some other um useful ones in here like for example if we go look over here and there's one called soil if i drag soil in there and then i connect it to my lakes node it'll kind of give us the areas where you would expect uh, soil to deposit from rain, uh, which is kind of cool. So all those areas are highlighted in white. Um, so that could be like a, a really useful mask to have for vegetation, for example, because you would expect water to flow down into the crevices and and grow, you know, more vegetation, right? Uh, so that's a pretty useful one to, to, to have. Um, so I ended up combining my rock map and my texture map um, together, and I came up with uh, selected here. I came up with this as kind of like my final landscape texture um, uh, look. And uh, Gaia has um, some pretty cool ways of colorizing this. Um, so if you look on the on the left hand toolbar, everything in the sort of like purple uh, color it, are ways to color your landscape. So I, I use one called sat maps. And these are all based off of um, apparently actual satellite data. So um, if you attach uh, a sat maps node, uh, and then you can you can kind of go through here and select uh, any given uh, sat map data. So these are sort of just based off of, you know, different terrains. Um, some of them are a little bit kind of weird looking, like, I don't know, this one's blue. Um, so you, you can kind of, you know, kind of just find what Kind of looks right. Uh, this doesn't necessarily affect uh, what we're going to do in Unreal. I actually don't use the sat map um, node to colorize in Unreal. I'll use uh, other finer textures. And uh, so, so this is sort of, I think, just useful from a visualization standpoint to sort of kind of like get a feel for what you want your final landscape to look like. Um, so I wanted my landscape to kind of be this kind of dry uh dry grassy uh thing so i kind of found like just one that kind of looked like dirt and then uh i added one final node here vegetation um just to kind of create like a map of like where we would see uh oops where we would see um you know some vegetation growing um anyway so i don't know that's a kind of a brief overview of gaia um one thing that I, I think uh, I'd like everyone to do, um, and this is kind of one of the cool things that I like about um, Gaia in general. Also, if you want to um, move this around, um, there's a couple things you could do. If you accidentally like zoom zoom too far in or something, you can't find it. You can click the zoom to extents button down on the bottom corner of the graph, and it'll show you that your whole graph. Um, but what I want everyone to do is to I guess go to their mountain uh, node and just select a random seed. 
So like, just, I don't know, just like click, click on a different seed and that'll create a completely unique, you know, mountain for your landscape generation. So everything that everybody creates in here should hopefully be completely unique. Um, and then, you know, once you do that, you should be able to like, kind of cl just click at the last node and it'll like auto fill, uh, uh, fill in your landscape. And hopefully that shouldn't take too long. Um, if it, if it is taking too long on your machine, you can, uh, you can take, you can click this little, uh, a resolution selector. So, um, you can select half K and that should hopefully make it run a lot faster, but if it's going through it at 1K for you, that's fine. And this is just the preview resolution too. So we can export at a higher resolution later. Um, you know, if you want to view it in really high detail, you could select 4K, but you'd probably sit here for about uh, five minutes waiting for it to generate the whole graph. So um, I recommend 1K or half a K. Um, okay, so um, from here, what we're going to go ahead and do is uh, export uh, our uh, terrain. So um, there's a few things that I did in this example project, um, uh, or a few things that I need to export in this example project. Um, one of them is this erosion map. Um, so this is kind of like our base landscape. And uh, the way that we export it is we can just right click and we can click mark for export. So you, you, you'll see in this project, we already have this one marked for export. Um, the shortcut for it is F3. Um, so I also exported the lakes. So this will create kind of the lakes uh, uh, mask. So it, it'll output this particular mask for us. So we'll know uh, where on our map the water should be roughly. Uh, and then the other one that I exported was this combine um, after the rock map and texture map. So that one's marked for export. And then the final one that I exported is the vegetation map. Um, okay, so from there, we can click this build tab up in the very top right corner and you should see uh, these different uh, different nodes here. And I renamed um, some of them. So uh, this landscape one is actually the lakes node. So this originally said lakes, um, but I wanted that to be kind of that. That's like basically my final um, export, the one that I'm going to use for our height map in Unreal. Um, and uh, and then we have our vegetation, that last node. And I call this one landscape texture. And this is actually our combined node. Um, and that this is what we're going to use to sort of texture the landscape um, to kind of give it some variety. Um, one of the things that you'll want to do is make sure that all of these say PNG on them. Um, Unreal Engine prefers PNG files. I think by default, Gaia actually tries to export it as a TIFF. Um, which Unreal Engine cannot uh, cannot use, but uh, PNGs work pretty well. It, they're like 16-bit, and so they have like really nice gradation and, and resolution. And just for the sake of time, we're going to do a 1K export. Um, I'm using the, uh, the pro version of Gaia, um, so I can select all these, these other uh, resolutions. You could select it now too and hit build, but it'll give you a warning saying that it can't do it or it'll, it'll like make a watermark on it. Um, but uh, so let's do uh, 1K. The community for, version can only do 1K? Uh, I believe, yeah, I believe it only does 1K. Okay. Um, but I, for, for a long time, I was using the community version um, and I was exporting 1K files, and then I was just resampling them um, to like 4K. And um, obviously, it's not, it's, I'm not gaining any resolution that way, but it allowed me to create 4K uh, landscapes or four kilometer by four kilometer landscapes in Unreal Engine. Um, so that, that's the scale that we're talking about here. So when we, when we talk about uh, like a thousand pixels, Unreal Engine regards one pixel as being one meter. Um, in terms of scale and on how it treats landscapes. So, so we'll do 1K, um, but yeah, you can, you can resample it to like much larger sizes if you want. Um, and uh, you know, if you wanna build a really large uh, scene, definitely not necessary for what we're doing. The final thing that I had selected um, before we export is this normalized um, 
selection. And the reason I do that, what that does is it, it basically does like an auto curves on your, uh, on all your height maps. So you have uh, the, the highest point will be pure white and the lowest point will be pure black. Um, and the reason that I wanna do that is so that we have the best uh, gradations for our slopes. So it, it'll make the slopes like a lot smoother. I've tried some of the other settings uh, on it and you can end up getting kind of like uh, kind of weird stepping in your landscape um, just because it'll have kind of lower resolution in terms of like, it's sort of like the color depth essentially. So um, use normalize. And then uh, the final thing is we, we wanna select our build destination. Gaia by default creates a folder inside your documents folder. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and select my desktop and CVP landscape demo. And I'm just gonna select this, this main folder to put our stuff in um, for now, or, or actually here, let's, I'm gonna create a new, I'll create a new folder and this will be uh, demo Gaia. All right, and then I'll click start build. And it, it'll always uh, ask you, uh, would you prefer to save the preview build? Um, I've actually had issues with saving the preview build. So um, I'm gonna say no. Basically it's saying, it's already computed the landscape. Uh, do you wanna just save what it computed? You know, the thing that you were previewing or do you want to recompute it? And um, like I said, I, I think it's always better to recompute. All right, so that was relatively quick, um, uh, at least on my end. Uh, let me know if there's anybody who's like still compiling um, after a minute here, or if any if anybody's not finished, I, I suppose. All right, so uh, that put it all these PNG files here. Um, so this is our main height map. Uh, let's take a look at that. This is erosion. Um, so that's what it looks like. That, that's what we're feeding into Unreal Engine. Um, and you know, like I said, the highest point in the map is bright white and the lowest point is, is dark black. Uh, so pretty straightforward. And all right, so um, now that that's uh, compiled, we're pretty much done with Gaia. Um, if you want, you can go ahead and save a copy um, of this terrain. If you click this little save incremental button next to the save button on the top, um, it'll add like a number to the landscape and just save like a new version of it. Um, so that's one of the cool things about Gaia is that you can create a really rapid random generation. Um, so you could create multiple iterations of a landscape and just change the seeds on all of the different nodes and come up with complete, something completely new. Um, okay, so uh, let's go ahead and close Gaia and uh, I can close this demo folder here. So here's our CVP landscape. Um, in Unreal Engine, uh, a couple of quick things to know in terms of navigation. Um, when you, if you want to look around uh, in, in your viewport, uh, the easiest way to do that is to just right click and then drag your mouse around. And uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the basics of, of looking around. The next thing is for moving the camera, we use while right clicking the W, A, S, and D keys as if you're playing a first person shooter. I don't know, everybody played a first person shooter game. Uh, so if we, if I press W, I go forward, press S, I go back, press A, I strafe to the left, press D, I strafe to the right, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so that's all like in plane stuff. And then if you press Q, you can go down, right, now we're below the landscape. Press E, you can go up. So pretty, pretty straightforward. So if I zoom way out here, we can sort of see the original landscape that I created. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, that was the one created from the same exact Gaia uh, project that uh, we were just in. And then if I click one, uh, or I'm sorry, I click three, I can go back to that view that I saved. And if you wanna save a view, for example, if you fly around this, the scene and you're like, you know, you find a composition that you like, uh, you know, maybe I prefer this, I can hit control and then a number. Um, so I can set this as control five. So now I can kind of step through and I can always get back to that view. You know, if I accidentally move my camera, and like where'd my view go? I just have hit five and I can go back to that viewport 
Um, so pretty straightforward there. So um, what is this? What is this uh, landscape composed of? Um, it has. Uh, if we select over here on the world outliner, let me make sure my 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 uh, workspace is kind of set to the default. All right, default editor layout. So hopefully this is kind of what, what you guys can see. Uh, so if we select the world outliner um, in the top left here, there's a list of all the assets that I've added to the scene to create it. Um, so we have them organized into folders. I have lights. I've got two different lights. I have a directional light, which is essentially our sunlight, and a skylight, which is sort of the fill. It's, it's kind of like the 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 bounce off of the clouds and the atmosphere and stuff like that um and then there's a bunch of meshes these are all of like trees that i placed it so i placed this black alder tree you know i can go through and sort of select the different things like i've got this granite rock and i've got a uh, fallen tree um and uh you know these are all assets that i i specifically placed for this particular composition um then there's a few few more things in here uh, for the sky. There's a sky atmosphere actor. Um, this is what simulates the blue of the sky. Um, there's a sky dome mesh, which is basically kind of background has background clouds in it. And these are all the defaults that I have uh, from Unreal. And I'll, I'll show you how to get these uh, from a, a brand new project. And then finally, I have the volumetric clouds actor, um, which is giving us these kind of nice clouds around. Um, and these clouds are dynamic too. I don't know if you, you can sit back and kind of watch them and they'll move around, uh, which is kind of cool. Then the final thing is our landscape. And this is the, this is the landscape that we Im will be importing from Gaia. Um, and there's this gizmo actor. This is basically just a way to, to move around stuff on the landscape, but uh, we don't really need to man manipulate that very much. Okay, so how do we, how do we get a, a scene like this? Uh, what I'm gonna have everybody do is uh, we're gonna create a new level. So from here, we're just gonna go file, new level. And uh, we have a, a, a few different selections here. We can do default, which is sort of like a uh, completely blank level. Time of day, which is what I used for this scene. And this is what we'll be using. And then they have some other things like a VR uh, thing. If you wanna view your thing in VR, it, it, it automatically has certain assets that are manipulable uh, with a VR headset um, or a completely empty level, which is, has nothing in it. Um, so I'm going to select the time of day level, and uh, I guess I'll go ahead and I'll save my current level. <clears throat> so here's the time of day level. It's uh, if we if we right click and kind of look around, you can see it's already got a bunch of stuff that we need. It's got a sun, it's got the sky, it's got clouds, um, and then it has a few things we don't need, like these sort of like basic things. And um, it, it does it, it does show you uh, a couple things here on this tooltip. It says use Control L plus mouse to move the sun around. So this is really cool. So if I do, if I do Control L, and then I hold down, keep keep holding down Control uh, after you hit Control L and move your mouse around, and you can move the sun uh, with your mouse, which is is really cool. You can go down to night if you need. Um, so we, but you know we can go go sunsetty. Uh, pretty easy way to, to move the light around. We can do this in our scene later, uh, which, will, which will be pretty cool. So uh, control L, I'm gonna make it daytime again here. Okay, so if we look over here on the world outliner again, uh, once again, this is just a list of everything that's in this 3D world that we've created. Um, there's a few things that we want and a few things that we don't. We don't want the floor, so we can select that, hit delete. Uh, we don't need the player start. This is like where the player would start if they were playing a game in this level. Um, we'll keep the sky atmosphere. We'll keep the sky dome mesh. We'll keep this skylight. Um, we don't need this preview mesh. We'll get rid of that. And we don't need these two text render actors. So I'll delete that. So you should just have now the directional light, sky atmosphere, sky dome mesh, skylight, and volumetric clouds um, in there. All right, is everybody moving along? Everybody good? Okay, so let's do our uh, landscape um, here. So Unreal Engine by default is in the select mode, um, which is essentially how you select and manipulate objects within the world. So you, you could select any given actor like that, that stump that I had uh, uh, in my previous scene, I can use the select mode to move that around. So that, that's kind of the default mode. 
Um, but if I go in here and I, I click the modes button, there's a landscape mode. So let's go ahead and select that. <clears throat> so once you open the landscape mode, since we, since we don't have a landscape, the first thing that it does is it asks us to create a new landscape. So it opens up this, this toolbar over on the left. And uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be importing a file. Um, so we're going to select this import from file uh, little checkbox. And this is where we're going to select the height map that we generated from Gaia. So I'm going to go ahead and click the little three dot button here on the height map file to browse to my height map. So I'll go to my desktop, landscape demo, open up that folder where we create where we saved our previous uh, landscape. And there's a couple of height maps that we can use in here. There's either erosion or we can use this uh, landscape. Uh, which one? Which one is it? Or landscape.png. Um, I'm going to use the erosion one because uh, it'll have all the like underwater like uh, uh, terrain in there. So if, if I, for some reason, wanted to do an underwater scene or something, I'd have that there. Um, so select erosion, click open. And uh, by default, when you when you first open it up, if, if we um, kind of hold right click and we zoom out, kind of move out, we'll see like a really loose wire mesh of our landscape. And it, as you can see, its proportions are a little bit ridiculous. I don't know if you can see that. Um, if your camera's not moving quickly also, you can select a faster camera speed on the top right corner here. I'm gonna go to like seven here just to zoom way out. You can also use your scroll wheel while moving to dynamically adjust your speed. Yeah. So, um, so looking at this, this is kind of like a little ridiculous looking, right? It's it's a it's a little bit too extreme, um, and that's the reason why it's doing that is because it is uh, using the raw data that we exported from Gaia. So it's treating pure black as like the ocean floor and pure white as like Mount Everest. So it's creating like this really extreme landscape. Um, but we can scale that um, by adjusting the Z. Uh, axis, which you can see it's labeled here in, in blue. So if we, you know, in blue here, so if you adjust it to like maybe, I don't know, 50% or something, uh, maybe that looks a little more reasonable, you know, just in terms of visual scale. Um, maybe I'll try 25%. We'll try that. So um, with that selected, uh, we can click import and, and just take a look at, at what it generated. Um, so by default, it'll have kind of like a, a really dark looking uh, texture on it because we haven't like, you know, fully textured it. And your landscape should look a little bit different than this, obviously, because you guys all had your own sort of random generation uh, on it. But I don't know, this is looking pretty cool to me. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, if I do control L again, I can uh, kind of manipulate the light here so that maybe we can, whoops, we can see something a little bit better. There we go. There's some shadows on it. So yeah, I don't know. That's that's looking kind of cool. I think I think we create a cool scene with that. Um, if you don't like the height of it, if it looks a little too ridiculous or something, you know, on, on that Z scale, you can you can un just undo basically and uh, and and go back, you know, or, or you know, delete delete your current landscape and re-import it, um, but that that's like looking relatively nice, I think. So, all right. So now that that's imported, um, there's a few things uh, within the landscape mode here um, that we're going to use to sort of texture our landscape. Um, uh, by default, when you're in landscape mode, it'll have this sculpt tab selected. And this is how you would sort of create a landscape by hand. So if, if I sort of go down into this one section here and I, I use the sculpt tool that's that's selected by default, um, I can, let me increase my brush size here. I can create my own like hills just by clicking around. Um, so that, that's like one way to, to be able to, to sort of manually uh, adjust your landscape. So for example, if you were setting up a virtual production stage um, and you wanted to, to do it kind of on this hill here, but obviously you're going to do this in 
a stage and you need a flat area, we could use this flatten section and we could just kind of flatten out the landscape, kind of like where we would have like our faux uh, stage. There we go. So now we have a, a thing that would integrate nicely with, uh, with a virtual production stage. Um, so yeah, so that's the sculpts, the sculpt tools. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do. You can even do erosion in it. So it'll simulate, you know, water flow and kind of make, uh, you know, crevices kind of go down and um, different types of erosion and, and whatnot. So there's a whole bunch of cool tools that you can use, but uh, basics are flatten sculpt, maybe smooth if you want to smooth something out a little bit. Um, okay, so from there, um, what we're going to do is we're going to select this uh, paint tab. It's, it's just to the right of scope. And the paint tab is, uh, is what we're going to use to kind of paint in the materials of our landscape. And um, the other thing we need to do here, okay. <clears throat> so um, right now we can't paint on the landscape because we have no landscape layers. And uh, so we're, we're going to actually start using some of the assets that um, I integrated into this, this uh, project download. So if we select the landscape uh, actor in the world outliner over in the top left, and we look at down at the details, we can see that there's no material set for the landscape. And a material in Unreal is basically a texture. Um, it's sort of like an advanced texture that has, it has a, a bunch of, of data that, that can go into it, things like normal maps and roughness and uh, metallic properties. So any kind of material you could think of that you would want to be able to generate in a virtual world, uh, you can simulate uh, with a material. Since we have no material, we have to select one for our landscape since it has this sort of blank material in it right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click uh, this little drop down, And you can see there's a whole bunch of different materials that we can select here. Um, but the one that I'm going to look for is uh, oh, actually, I need to I need to figure out what I used here. Bear with me for just a moment. Okay, so <clears throat> if we look in our content browser here, um, the the landscape material that I ended up using is from this grass library, which um, this is this asset basically. Um, where is it? Uh, this temperate vegetation asset has its own set of like landscape materials in it. So that's the one that I use as like my base um, for this project. So if we select default landscape, uh, in, in, in or, I'm sorry, PN grass library materials, landscape materials, and then default landscape, then you can see that we have uh, these different landscape materials here. And the one that we're interested in using is this MI layer ground. Um, MI is usually the prefix used on a material instance. And so for any given like level that you create, even if you're using the same basic uh, landscape material, you would usually create your own instance of it. Um, that way you have sort of like your own specific controls for, for that particular landscape. So I'm going to select that MI layer ground and I'm going to drag it into the landscape material over on the right side there. And it's going to compile shaders for a minute here. Um, hopefully that's not too, too uh, slow for, for you guys. Okay. So by default, it's going to be a completely black landscape, um, and that's okay. Uh, so we have to sort of like fill it in basically with, uh, with our different layers. So let me make my content browser a little smaller here, and I'm going to zoom out on our landscape. And if you go up here to the paint tab, make sure the paint tab is selected. And um, that'll give you this little thing over on the left. And these are all the different layers that this particular landscape material has in it. Um, 
And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just um, fill in one of the layers just so that we, we can kind of see some definition in the landscape. So um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to click this little plus button for create layer info. This is basically a file that will store uh, the information for this paint layer. And we're going to use a weighted blend layer. Um, you don't really need to know what that means. It doesn't really matter. Um, by default, it'll just save it into this untitled shared assets uh, folder. That's fine. Just hit OK. Doesn't really matter. Um, and then it'll fill in your landscape with this base uh, ground layer. And if we zoom, if we kind of like move our, our mouse around and kind of kind of go down and, and take a look at our landscape, you can see that it, it's got some texture on there. Looks like a little bit of grass and some dirt. Um, but for the most part, the landscape looks, it looks like extra uniform. Um, like here's our, here's our like virtual production stage area. And it, you know, everything just kind of looks kind of blobby and, you know, not too, not too great. So um, I actually need, I know where my notes went here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use some of those other maps that we generated from Gaia to kind of help texture the landscape. So if you remember, if we go back to um, take a look at that folder, we created a bunch of different things. So um, one of the things that it outputted, for example, is this like erosion wear uh, image. So if I open that up, you can see sort of this is the areas where water would have flowed. Um, so you could sort of imagine like, all right, if the water flows in the erosion where, you know, map, that's probably where I would want like kind of greener grass. So I'm going to use this base ground three, uh, layer. I'll go ahead and create, go ahead and create its weighted blend layer thing. Just hit okay. The plus button hit okay. And, uh, we're going to import that layer from file. So. I'll click, uh, I basically right click on that base ground three and click import from file. And then we can go and select uh, any one of our maps uh, that guy had generated. And in, in this case, I think it's most appropriate to do this erosion where.png. And we'll go ahead and click open. Um, it'll give you this warning about the, the file size not being exactly the same. Um, Gaia outputs a 1024 by 1024 image, but for some reason, Unreal works in these like weird integers. Um, it's fine. Just hit OK. Basically, it means that there's going to be a blank area on the edge of our, our scene. OK, so uh, once you do that, it'll take a second to kind of generate, uh, uh, do some, compile some shaders. But now that we have that in there, basically what it, you can see that it's doing is it's filling in these kind of crevices with denser grass. Um, so it's using that, that map that we generated to put a denser amount of grass in, uh, in the crevices where you would expect it to be. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, so it's sort of like a way to start to break up um, you know, the landscape to give it a little bit more texture. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add not I originally wanted the scene to have kind of like dry grass. So um, I created this, uh, uh, a couple other layers um, in here that will have drier grass. And what we're gonna do is on this base ground seven, I'm gonna hit the plus button again, do a weighted blend layer, hit okay. And um, just to give you an idea, so what we can do here, you know, this is this can also be done manually. So if I select that layer, that 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 uh, base ground seven layer, and I go in here with this brush, I can adjust the brush size up here uh, just by clicking and dragging. Um, I can sort of paint in on my landscape that particular layer. It'll take a second to compile shaders when you do that, but. Um, you can see here now it's painted in this dry grass instead. So that's kind of like the dry grass layer. Um, so you could go in here, you could maybe adjust the, the fall off of the brush or the strength right now it's set to one by default. I'm gonna do it like real light. So let's say you wanted to, um, to kind of just do like a little, little patches of dry grass. 
you could go in here and just do like really light painting and it would just start filling that in. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. So these landscape layers um, uh, kind of lost my train of thought here. These particular landscape layers um, that we're using are specific to that asset set that 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 I uh, um, you know that I downloaded for free from the from the marketplace. Um, but there's a whole lot of stuff available on the marketplace that you know can be completely different from this. This is obviously like a grass library, so it's all grass. Um, so basically, any any layer that you select here and, and and would paint down, it would be just a different type of grass. But um, for example, uh, something that I would recommend you guys checking out is uh, this month, if you go um, to the Unreal Engine Marketplace and you go to the free for the month section, they actually have a winter forest scene. Um, and I believe that this has a uh, some landscape material. It has a snow landscape material. So this is a completely different landscape material that has snow layers in it. So you could do the same sort of thing and likely paint in, you know, different types of, uh, uh, you know, different scenes with snow. Um, so, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of, of what you can do. Um, okay. Hey, Ian, can I ask another question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I noticed in the, in the, in some of the textures, there's this motion in there. Is that baked into the asset or is that something that can be manipulated? Yeah, so, um, so this is something that, uh, the the specific grass that I downloaded um, happens to have. Um, they have like a wind, uh, you know, uh, essentially wind motion built into the material of the grass. And most decent assets on the marketplace will already have that in there for foliage. Um, so it's something that you would kind of expect. I mean, mo even like most of the free stuff that I've downloaded all has kind of a real nice, you know, little grass like motion in there. Trees and stuff usually have like tree sway. And uh, I can actually show you in um, some of the trees that we place in here, um, we'll actually be able to manipulate the speed of the, the wind to give ourselves that was, Yeah, more, that was the question I was getting motion. at. Was that, was that something we yeah. can make more subtle or if it's a little bit more- Yep, yeah, yeah. An, yeah. Most animated, you know, if you can animate it at all. Yep, yeah, we, yeah, we, can, we can modify that. Um, so let's actually kind of move on to that. Um, so we're getting a couple things in here. Um, and sometimes this takes some manual tweaking or whatever. I don't know if you guys notice on your landscape, if you sort of zoom out, you can start to see some, uh, some repetition in the texture. You can see sort of like, you know, you can see the pattern in it. I mean, that's obviously just based on the fact that the texture has limited resolution. So it's just tiling it. Um, and so that's kind of where we can bring in our other uh, layers to hopefully kind of break up the monotony uh, a bit. So I'm just going to try, let's go into maybe, let's try this layer number four, base ground four. Um, I'll create another uh, weighted blend layer for it. And let's try to import, uh, I'm, right, I'm going to right click and click import from file on that. And let's try to import like our landscape texture uh, PNG here. So you can see like this one has, it has like a really nicely defined map uh, of the landscape. And hopefully by using two different textures, it'll, it'll look a little bit better. Um, I've found that uh, there are a few packs, uh, like asset packs on the, on the marketplace that I'd recommend um, if, you, if you are getting into doing kind of these outdoor scenes that work a lot better in terms of like large scale uh, tiling or they'll give you a little bit more control over it um but i just imported that landscape blend oh well, it looks a little bit better there's still maybe a little bit of tiling in there you know if we wanted to we could kind of go in and like kind of manually paint out tiling too you could just kind of you know use your brush and if there's something that was bothering you you could sort of paint in your own little design to try and and, and mitigate that um, that's actually a really good way uh, to do it if, if there's still things bothering you. You guys could could import, you know, any any one of these layers at, uh, from one of those Gaia files. Like if I, if I do this base ground one, the one with the uh, or base ground seven, and I, I instead choose that same texture node, um, it should give us a completely different look for the landscape. Um, so now it's a lot, you know, drier overall. Uh, 
but if we zoom out again, um, you can see it's it looks pretty good from far. Um, there's definitely some tiling in there still, but that's where you would go in. If there's anything bothering you in the scene, you go in and sort of just kind of manually paint it out. Um, some of the, the packs that I recommend from the marketplace are, um, one of them is this Brushify uh, pack. If you search Brushify on the marketplace, uh, there's one guy, um, Joe Garth, he makes a bunch of different landscape asset packs. They all have landscape textures in them um, and they're, they're really well uh, organized and, and fairly easy to use. And he's got like a ton of like YouTube videos and stuff about how to use his packs, um, how to use the assets and, and really create some really great scenes. Um, and one of the things that he has in it uh, is different scaled tiling for the landscape textures. Uh, and it, so it makes it a lot easier than, than this, this free pack that I'm using. Um, I definitely recommend uh, checking those out if you are, are getting into um, you know, doing your own landscapes. I think his packs are probably the easiest to use of any of the ones that I've used. Um, there's a, a couple other ones, ones made by uh, Vertex uh, Interactive, Vertex Interactive. Let's see if that shows up. Huh. Oh, I don't know if I can search by. If you just search landscape, it'll come up. All right, yeah, these ones labeled vertex. If you search landscape on the on the marketplace, these are all like really really nice um, landscapes, uh, really great textures and stuff uh, for that. That all they all look really great at pretty much any scale. Like zoomed really far out. Um, I definitely recommend these packs. Um, super super nice. Anyway, um, yeah, so that kind of gives you an idea of of uh, what's available out there. So here we have our landscape. And uh, the last sort of thing, I guess, that we kind of need to bring in there to start to, to, to close it out and kind of really make it uh, look nice are uh, some, some models, some uh, meshes in there. So if we look at our content browser on the bottom here. Um, there's a bunch of different assets in here that, uh, should be useful for you guys. Um, if we go into mega scans uh, here, there's uh, a folder with different 3D assets. Um, I think you guys might have maybe a pared down version of this, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can select any, any given one of these things. I'm gonna try and find that fallen tree that we had. So the bottom of the list here, here's tree fallen zero, zero. And if we select that, um, oops, we, we need to, so we're in the landscape painting mode. We need to change our mode to the select mode. So I'm gonna go to select up on the modes toolbar. And all we need to do is just drag this SM, which stands for static mesh uh, SM file into our scene. And then now we have a fallen tree. Pretty easy, uh, we can sort of, Move it up and down with this gizmo. Um, you know, I, you can select the different axes and get, you know, your different motion. If you press spacebar, it'll change the gizmo on the object. So you can sort of, uh, you know, you can rotate it if you want it to be rotated. Uh, you can scale it. So if you want it to be bigger, smaller. Um, so yeah, there's rotate, scale, and then move. Um, and you know, just just drag, clicking and dragging the the asset allows you to do that. Pretty straightforward. I'm gonna go ahead and save my viewport here. Five. So now I can hit five, and it'll just come back to that scene. Uh, so we got a fallen tree in there, and then if we want, we can go to uh, let's add some trees. So at the top of the content browser here, you should have a folder called Black Alder. Um, and that's that tree pack. So if we go ahead and go to geometry and foliage types. I don't think we can drag the foliage type. Okay, yeah, we want the simple wind ones. So go to geometry and then simple wind. And we can basically literally drag and drop these trees into our scene. 
Um, kind of move that around. Let me kind of put this one off to the side. I don't know. Take take your pick. I think I you guys probably have like four trees available. Um, so that's kind of like manual manipulation in terms of like adding static meshes. Um, there's one last thing that I want to show you guys kind of before we close out, and that's um, using the foliage tool. So, you know, it, it's it's one thing to place all your assets like by hand, um, which is very useful for like kind of the close up stuff, you know, in your scene where you, you kind of like want like fine tune control over or where you're placing everything. Um, but for certain things, maybe you want to just kind of fill out your scene really quickly. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways to do that in Unreal. The main way to, of doing it, that is the foliage tool or like foliage mode. So if we go to the mode, mode button again and switch to foliage, um, we get on the left side here, this, this paint box and it says drop foliage here. And uh, I created for you guys um, these different foliage types. Um, so if we look in the content browser here, again, under black alder geometry and then foliage types, um, there's uh, these particular foliage type uh, files. And the foliage type is basically a definition of how it should treat the static mesh uh, in terms of foliage distribution. So if you were to open, open that up, like any one of these foliage types, it has a bunch of different parameters for like, how should it place this tree? Um, and you have things like uh, random yaw, uh, it'll, it'll randomly rotate the tree. Uh, it'll randomly put it at a five degree, up to five degree pitch angle, um, things like that. You can even choose which landscape layers you want to include it on. So like, for example, when we use that erosion layer that we imported for the green grass, perhaps maybe we only want our trees to be on the areas that uh, the water flowed. So we could choose that by adding uh, an inclusion layer and only include our trees in that landscape layer. So there's a lot of tools uh, you know, that you have here in terms of how to, how to define the placement of a tree. Um, anyway, so, so that's what a, a, a landscape foliage or a, a foliage type is. So I'm going to select uh, all five of these trees that we have here for foliage types, and we're going to drag and drop them uh, into that left-hand toolbar. And uh, with that in there, we're going to select all of this. We want to like hold down Shift and click, you know, click each one, uh, or click the first one, click the last one, and then uh, click the checkbox. So that means that we'll actively be painting foliage. Um, and then the last thing that we want to do um, that you'll want to check is um, for your foliage painter, my zoom thing is sort of covering it here, um, but you want to make sure that the density, move that, the density should be relatively low. Um, I think I have it set to 0 0.001. Um, and if we use this brush, we can literally just click around our landscape and start painting in trees. Um, so this is like, you know, this is Bob Ross, your Bob Ross moment, basically, for your landscape, you can paint in your happy little trees. And that is basically how I made that landscape uh, for the demo. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, you could go in and kind of fill out even more of that landscape if you wanted to, like, kind of just keep painting in trees. You know, maybe you have a scene where you want to do a whole bunch of different shots. Um, you know, you want to do some reverses and stuff too. So you want to have some trees in the background. Um, yeah, that's, uh, so now we have like tons of different compositions we have for this particular landscape that we can use. Uh, pretty straightforward. So there's, yeah, I, I guess that's, is that's, there, that's. Is there a way to change like uh, if the mesh will show up like at, at, a, at a particular distance? Because like some of these, like if you're placing things in the far distance, you know, the LODs are going to be far enough. Mm -hmm. Is there is there an easy way to change that? Um, are you talking about like actually manipulating the LOD? Um, well, so that it, it, I think it's just like the draw distance. I think that there's meshes yeah. at a certain distance will. Right. It, it sort of depends on the, it depends on the particular, uh, mesh, I suppose. So like, for example, um, 
we could go into the content browser here and all these foliage types like if i click on this you can see that this one is based on this sm black alder field uh static mesh so if i open up that static mesh uh, we have control over the lod's so you know we could go in and uh i suppose basically manipulate the LOD levels. So um, by default, these already have LODs. So you know, if I kind of zoom zoom out really far here, you can see like here's like a, there's a really drastic change right there that you can see. Like it it ditches the shadow and like the the model clearly becomes like less complex. Um, and when we do that, we can see it's it selects LOD six. So we could go in here and we could select um, oh yeah, LOD picker on the right here, and we can select LOD six. Um, now we can like zoom in and see what like see what LOD six actually looks like. Let me see it a little faster here. So here's LOD six. It's sort of like this kind of like weird, you know, weird optimized version of it. And then you could go in and you could sort of like manipulate um, that particular LOD like when it shows up based on the screen size. So maybe you don't want this LED to show up at all. So you would want, you, you could just like set it to zero or you could even remove uh, LOD six entirely. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question? I, I suppose, uh, like you could select custom and then just get rid of LOD six. Yeah. And now it, now it won't even do it. Like if I zoom out, it'll just yeah. keep LOD five, which like will yeah, look just, better. Just so that all it, like, Cause I could see like with certain, like if there was, Sometimes there might be like if you were moving the camera just slightly on the edge of yes. you would see like a popping. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like and I found that that that's very it's super variable depending on what um, what assets you're using, like how they set up the LODs. Like the Brushify stuff is like super optimized for games, so it it like very quickly jumps to a lower. Uh, like a, or a, a higher LOD level um, to to try and and reduce the you know the number of uh, of triangles that it's using, um, but yeah, it, it, it's just going to depend on the asset. So you, like you, you can see right here, if I zoom out, there's like a tree in the back that like it's darker. It's like clearly jumping a LOD. Um, so I could just go in, click edit on all of these, and uh, oh wait, I can't. I need to. I would need to go in. Select each static mesh, uh, go to the LOD picker, do custom, get rid of the LOD six, hit save. Um, and then, you know, repeat, rinse and repeat for all the different assets that I'm putting in there. Hopefully that that, that would, you know, kind of fix the issue. Um, there's a couple thing, other things too, like, I don't know, just, just to sort of, I guess, close this out in terms of what we can do. You can see there's kind of like a weird shadow that moves when I move the camera. Um, so by default, uh, the directional light in Unreal doesn't support, or it, it, it's set to like kind of like a, a fairly short distance in terms of dynamic lighting. Um, so if we select the directional light in the, the world outliner, um, I think we can search, it's cascade, yeah, cascaded shadow maps. So for any given asset, you can use this little search bar to try and find something. Um, in, in the details pane. So I'm gonna search cascade and there's this ca dynamic shadow distance for movable light. Um, and if we adjust that, you can see it changes kind of where that shadow is going. Um, and it, it, it actually has a maximum on it. So you can drag it out and it, it, it like maxes it out at 20,000, but that's not very realistic because we have a much larger uh, scene. So we can just like add another zero to that. And now it's now it's doing dynamic shadows for the entire landscape. Um, so, so I increased it to 200,000 and now we have like proper dynamic shadows for the, the rest of the landscape. You can see those lods actually on the, on the trees. Um, another thing that's um, kind of like really nice in terms of, uh, and, and pretty much essential I suppose, um, for, for most scenes is uh, using a post-process volume. Um, I didn't have that in my example um, thing because I didn't think it was like super necessary, but over in this place actors uh, toolbar on the left here, if we type in post, 
um, it'll have post-process volume. So I'll just like click and drag this into my scene. There we go. It'll it'll place like a little box with it with a widget on it. Um, and this is how you can manipulate things like exposure uh, and whatnot. And the first thing that you want to do after you drag your post-process volume in it um, is I'm gonna I'm gonna search uh, infinite in uh, in the, the details pane and check this box that says infinite extent, because uh, I wanted to, to manipulate my entire scene. The only reason why you would want to do a non-infinite post-process volume is, for example, if you want to change the exposure of a scene um, from one location to another. So you can have like, you can manipulate the size of this box. So you can have it like darker in one section of your map or brighter in another section, for example. Um, but I'm going to check infinite extent. So it, this applies to everything. So now that we have that selected, um, we can go into this, you know, with post process volume selected in the world outliner, we can adjust things like exposure. So I can use, uh, you know, I can do manual exposure if I want. Um, and where's our camera? So we have, we can kind of dial in things like our actual uh, camera parameters. So oh, it's so dark. Oh, I need to select. Uh, by physical camera exposure. Oh, uh, so this, this is actually, uh, I know why it's, it's really dark. So right now our directional light is just set. If we select that, it's set to one lux. And it's not very, very bright. Um, so this, you know, actual sunlight is like something more on the, on the scale of like a hundred thousand lux. I'm not gonna change that right now, um, but it basically means that our, our scene looks relatively dark because the sun is really dim. Um, so I'm just gonna use the exposure compensation slider uh, under, under manual exposure to kind of adjust our exposure, so. Um, there's a few extra things in post-process volume that are, are very nice in terms of creating sort of a photorealistic um, scene. Uh, one of them is this bloom parameter. You can see how the sun, it has like kind of like this Kind of jittering bloom around it, and you can you can sort of manipulate that too. Um, I really like convolution bloom. It looks a little bit more like a typical uh, typical lens, and you can adjust the intensity of it as well. I don't know why it's not letting me do that. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it's not letting me adjust the intensity of it right now. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and move on from that. There's also like lens flares that you can add. This one's like pretty ugly. Uh, dial down the intensity. Do like 0 0.1, 0 0.03, 0 0.03. It's okay. Point zero one. The uh, the color grading elements seem to be pretty interesting as well. Yeah, yeah. I so I really use post process volume. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't used it a whole lot either. But yeah, if you're trying to like create a certain look um, in camera, to yeah, there's all kinds of things like yeah, white balance temperature. Um, you can do yeah, global saturation, contrast, gamma gain, and offset adjustments. So you can actually add. You know, actual color curves to it. Um, yeah, sometimes, whole... sometimes we'll do stuff to correct uh, during production. Right. Yeah. Not... Like try to try to match match the lights of the stage or whatever. Yeah, but we um, wouldn't typically would avoid grading, but that'd be kind of fun for some stuff you're doing. Yeah. Um, um, one one last thing. Um, I actually don't. I'm not really sure if this will work or not. Sometimes you might be trying to get like an like an actual foreground element, say that's physically in the set to match with what's on the volume too. So you know you Correct. might want to go in and and selectively be like, oh, I got to get that patch of grass to like not be so saturated green because it doesn't really match what I'm my foreground is trying to. Right, right. I mean, in that case, you then you might have to go into the actual material of the grass to to manipulate it too. Yeah. 
Um, I hope that was a, a brief overview and I hope that was like reasonable for anybody who hasn't used Unreal before. Um, I kind of kind of like wish I could see all your guys' screens to see what you guys put together if you did. <laughs> well, we can, Mine's uh, not as good looking. <laughs> we, can, we can certainly share our screens. I'll, yeah, I'll, uh, all and I'd be happy to answer any questions too before we close out. But sure. Yeah. Hope that was hope that was helpful. Yeah, here, uh, I'll, I'll share. Uh, let's see. Share that. That's what I ended up with. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You dragged some rocks in there too. Yeah. I forgot about the rocks. <laughs> yeah. I got some rocks. Got some. I, I like these trees a lot. But uh, yeah. It, it, uh, Ended up making, and this is actually my work computer, which is awesome. This is at my office. Um, but yeah, I ended up like making like a channel. Now, if how did like was there an easy way to like add the water in? Did you just like bring that in as a plane? Oh yeah, um, I can I can sort of show you that. Yeah, there's there's actually a couple. So I I haven't actually decided how I like doing water uh, in Unreal. Um, I've, I've tried like so many different assets um, and I included one in the pack, one of the free ones that's, it's okay, but it's hard to get it to look really great. Um, so if I, let's see, if I let's kind of zoom out here. So yeah, right now we just have like, kind of like a, you know, the edge of the map in there. Um, but if we go and select, where is it? Water materials um, in the content browser. And then uh, I believe meshes. So there's a whole bunch of different things that this particular asset pack includes. Um, I think the, the, the main one that I use was just called water. I think it's just water plane. Um, so I go ahead and go down here. If I drag water plane down. And then if I just make this really, really big, so switch the gizmo to the to the size thing and then start dragging out. Size. I can I could just go in here and kind of scale it this way. make it like 10,000. Where is water plane located? Where is that at? Uh, it should be under uh, contents, water materials, and then meshes. Okay. Let me let me know if it's not in there because it's possible. Know, what is going on here? What did I do? I have no idea what I just did. OK. Yeah, so that one doesn't look all that great <laughs> by default. <laughs> Um, and I mean, one of the issues with it is this is like the, the material that it's using. Um, let me see. I, I thought I made a better material for it. Let me take a look here. I mean, one called Lake or something like that um, in my original. Yeah. Let's do m.lake. Maybe that'll look, yeah, that's a little bit better. A little bit better. I don't know. Um, OK, well, anyway, that's the that free asset on the marketplace. Luckily, in, uh, in Unreal Engine 4.26, I think they created um, kind of like a water tool. And you can enable that by going to, let's see, where are we? If you go to settings and then plugins and just search search in the, the bar up here, search water and then check enabled here. And it'll ask you to restart. Um, go ahead and save. Uh, you have to save your map. Um, so let's call this, I'm gonna call this CVP landscape two. Zero two, and it'll it'll restart Unreal, and uh, when it opens up, I think it'll probably have to compile some shaders, but it'll give you some new uh, 
actors that you can place um, just like a post-process volume or whatever you just drag and drop and there will be water actors basically that you can manipulate and I think there's just one called like water custom that's like really easy to use it basically gives you a flat plane and you can just kind of manipulate it however you want um, and, and all the default settings for it look really really good um, I don't know how quickly uh, I'll be able to open this if I'll be able to show it to you because it has to compile the shaders but that's what I would recommend doing is uh, is checking out the ones that are built into Unreal for the, the water plugin if you want to do water. Yeah, there's a ton. It comes with like water body custom, water <clears throat> inclusion volume, water body island. Like it's kind of nuts. Yeah, it and has it has like river. cool like spine based uh, spline based ones. So you can kind of manipulate the shape of like the water uh, to fit you know a specific area. Um, Yeah, so I don't you know how to like say make a river or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I think Epic Games, uh, like the Unreal team, release a few videos. If you just search Unreal Water or something like that, like 4.26 Water, I think they have a few tutorials that go through like each and every thing that you can do in it, um, just to you know show you kind of how it works with, uh, you know. With the landscape and stuff like that, I, I think it also supports their like landmass uh, plugin, which is another feature, uh, which I didn't want to get into. But basically, that allows you to manipulate the landscape um, a little bit more fully. Um, there's like some integration, so like you can do like uh, like apply materials like a road or something to the landscape really easily, and uh, you know it, it'll like automatically raise the landscape up to the road. Uh, for you, things like that. Um, but it also integrates really well with water where you can like have the water flow properly, you know, down, down a landscape. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see, let's see if that worked. Of course, it still has like 3000 shaders to compile. Um, but so here's the, here's the, my original scene. You can see I have some water in there already. Um, so if I, kind of zoom over here, kind of show you what that looks like. So if I just click on this water, you can see that I just placed a plane, placed SM water plane in there. And I'm using the M Lake instance material, um, which looks, it looks okay. It looks pretty good, I guess. Um, and the cool thing about like the materials that these use, like I can go into that instance uh, material instance, I can just double click it and take a look at the different parameters for the water. So, you know, if I wanted to change like the color of the water, I could go in there and kind of manipulate that. Maybe I want it to be a little greener where it gets deep. Uh, go in there and manipulate the, the pond, make it look a little bit green. Uh, and you, you can do other things too, like the tiling of the texture on it, um, how quick it is, uh, you know, the movement on it. So I go up to one, the water moves a little bit faster, things like that, um, relatively easy to manipulate. But anyway, um, now that I did that, if I say want to fill in this pond again with some other water, maybe we can do that. Okay, so just delete that mesh. And then if we go to this place actors and I just type in water, now that we enable that plugin, we have got a whole bunch of different things that we can add in here. I just do the water body custom, kind of select that and then let's see if I can scale it really big. hasn't compiled the shader yet. So it's probably gonna take a minute to show up. Oh, it also, I don't know if it has a material here. Or maybe it just needs to compile a shader. I'm not sure. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it goes. It just had to compile it. Um, so let's keep scaling that up.
So I'll just drag it out to the extents of the area there. a little bit bigger here there we go all right so yeah that one looks pretty good a lot bluer i'm sure that's manipulable i'm sure we can go into the material again and and uh figure out a way to to change the color of it but so th this is the unreal engine uh water and i think this one's pretty nice it's got like refraction and everything built into it so it's you know act actually refracting what's what's below it uh, which is pretty cool so it looks a little more like a tropical, tropical beach or something like that. But um, so yeah, that's the that's the built-in Unreal Engine water. Yeah. All right. Nice. Any any questions, guys? Yeah. Does anyone does anyone want to share? Uh, anyone got? If anyone. It's pretty rough over here. <laughs> <laughs> I was with you until you, we got to the trees and then my system just went wackadoodle. Oh yeah, yeah, so that- I, I had, I have no mouse right now. Oh. It went away, I can't bring it back. Huh, and okay. I figure I have to reboot, so. I yeah, uh, I did include, I mean, those are, those mega scans trees are very, very highly detailed. Um, so yeah, uh, it probably requires a, fairly beefy computer to run. I'm running my stuff on a um, RTX 2060, which is kind of like a mid mid range, like previous generation graphics card. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> for virtual, for actual virtual production, you'd probably want something a little higher, a little higher grade than that even. Um, like I can usually do a scene like that and maintain you know, like 30 frames per second. Um, obviously, if you were going to do a virtual production scene, you'd want to be able to probably do the full 60 for the displays. Um, but yeah, I mean, graphics graphics hardware is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there are maybe some ways to, like, like um, you know, I'm, I built my scene with a, I'm running a, a 1080 which is even a generation before that one and it it like works okay it's like i can like definitely build scenes and like say you know as someone that's more interested in being on the artist side of things it's you know if you can kind of get something that to like runs it okay you know generally when you got to actual actual virtual production there would be a, a couple computers there that would be way high end it's kind of as long as you can run the programs enough to like manipulate the, the content. And, um, yeah, yeah. Get uh, to something too that I, I guess that I, I wanted to um, show is, so th this scene that I built, um, I built it in the, like the base, the base project is a, a third person, uh, a third person game. So you can hit play and you can run around the scene. And I actually think that's like a very useful thing to do when you're designing the scene to give yourself a sense of scale of like what something looks like relative to a human being. Um, and, you know, obviously if you were gonna use this in virtual production, you're not going to, uh, you know, you don't need it in game mode, right? You're, Cause you're gonna be manip manipulating cameras and stuff. <clears throat> You'd be creating a virtual production scene. So, you know, when you create a new project in Unreal, it, uh, you know, it, it asks you like what uh, what you want to create. And so you would probably go in here and do film television and then choose, you know, like a virtual production template or something for creating it. But, you know, even doing that, creating your project, what you could do is, uh, you know, initially do your scene design in third person view, uh, you know, game mode. And then it's just a matter of, uh, of simply migrating your assets to, uh, to your your virtual production scene so you would literally just like go to maps and then do find you know select your cvp map or whatever uh right click it go to asset actions and then click migrate and then you select your your other uh your other projects 
and it'll, it'll tell you like, okay, it's going to take all of the stuff that we used in the scene and migrate it. And then you can uh, select the content folder for your uh, virtual production scene. So, so, so that's kind of how, like, I would look at, at building it is like, you don't necessarily need to be like in virtual production mode to build a scene like this. Um, I, I think it's very, very useful to be able to, yeah. to sort of see it with like a human scale in there. Yeah, um, especially if you were going to do something that had more um, uh, like buildings or something like yeah, human, yeah, exactly. Human objects like that, having like that because I, I what is the mannequin? It like, it's about six foot, I think. I think so. Yeah, shape, yeah. maybe a little shorter. So it's kind of a like a, it is a good reference. I, I use it a lot. I, like you can also just get the um, just like grab the actual mannequin itself to drag and drag and drop him. Yeah, in the I'll, scene. I'll do that yeah. for some of my scenes when I'm blocking them out is just have like a character reference of oh like i need this wall to be you know x x size or something relative to a person so yeah 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 some of the uh some of the things um that i really have learned to enjoy in the um from some of the like at like really good asset packs that that are available on the marketplace for doing these outdoor scenes is um a lot of them have like auto, essentially auto masking on the landscapes. Um, so they have what, what they'll call like an auto landscape material. And uh, along with those, it'll automatically do procedural uh, like rocks and, uh, you know, twigs and stuff like that on the ground. Um, so you don't even need to place those necessarily. So. Like for example, that Brushify pack that I had mentioned before, or the Vertex packs, um, some of those, like Brushify in particular, has uh, like procedural rock placement, like automatically on landscape. So um, you don't even need to spend the time to like import the the Gaia uh, map that you, you created for um, for like where you want the grass and stuff to be. You could just like let the Brushify pack like do it automatically with their auto material, um, which is pretty cool. So that can save a lot of time for just like creating a scene very, very quickly. Um, and then of course you could go in there and you know manually paint if you needed to, to, to get any particular thing in there, so. I have a uh, probably a new question about this. Um, there's like a grid in Unreal. Um, yeah. It's, what is that oriented to? And is there any like rhyme or reason to where you orient your landscape in relation to that grid? Uh, no, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I think it's arbitrary. Um, you could, if you want, um, there is a uh, kind of a cool plugin. So if you go to settings, or is it a plugin? Yeah, I think it's a plugin. Settings and you search sun. There's the sun position calculator. And if you enable that, uh, it'll ask you to restart. Again, I'm not going to do it right now. Um, but uh, sun position calculator gives you a new actor called uh, sun sky, um, which obviously I don't have it enabled right now, so it won't, it won't show up. But you could, you could place the sun sky actor. And the sun sky actor is essentially what we started when we created a new level. So if I got a new level and do time of day, um, the Sun Sky Actor gives you an integration of both the directional light, sky atmosphere, uh, and skylight, I believe. And um, then it ties that to a day, day of time calculation with latitude and longitude. So in your details pane for the Sun Sky, you would have an actual like date of you know or date and day of time uh or time of day sorry uh that you can input so if you want it to be like 4 p.m in chicago or whatever you could input all that information and it would put the sun in the correct position and when you drag the sun, sun sky actor into your scene it has a north direction on it so there is like a specific direction that it'll orient orient itself relative to your landscape. So cool. that might, you know, that's the only th thing that I can think of in terms of like direction that would matter is uh, if you actually wanted to define a specific north, I think there's probably, you know, a specific north for 
you know how it how it treats yeah. the landscape but True. yeah i don't know i mean that uh, might be interesting depending on there's some like uh, new york assets and things like that that are available on that the store it'd be nice to you know if you're on fifth avenue if the sun's in the right right direction like you know, have, sort of thing. have a scene that that like actually makes physical sense you sure. know yeah um, yeah yeah, I think that, and you, you can you can do north offset on that too. So for some reason, the map that you created originally uh, was not oriented properly. You could uh, rotate the sun sky so that you have north facing in the, in the proper direction. You know, like along the avenues or whatever. So cool. Yeah. Nice. Just instead of going out freezing my ass off for um, what is that sunset henge or. <laughs> the Manhattan, Manhattan Henge. Well, either one. Chicago's got one too. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Just fake it, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I, one last thing I wouldn't mind uh, sharing here, just to give you guys an idea of other scenes that I built with this exact method. Um, I created a little like. Uh, A little collection of photos here. Um, oops. Okay. So, yeah, here's here's like a bunch of scenes that uh, I essentially created with exactly the same workflow. I, I like literally did nothing different uh, from what we did today, and uh, these are just all using uh i don't know various uh various different assets from the marketplace uh this is like one of the vertex landscapes uh landscape textures that i'm using on this one um this is my own custom night sky that i've built which some of you guys have seen and uh so yeah that sort of gives you an idea of uh kind of what you can do and yeah there, there really isn't anything else um in any of these scenes that I didn't do, you know, today in my demo, so except for maybe drag in my my night sky uh, actor in there. So yeah, like these, some of these trees here are just like the mega scans trees. A um, few of these, these are from like a brushify pack. This particular scene are brushify trees. And a lot of these uh, like images were created with the same landscape. Like this is the same landscape as this, uh, is the same landscape as this, is the same landscape as this. It's just in a different part of the map. So like, you know, creating a map like this, like I think this is a fork. It's a 1K map made in Gaia Community Edition, scaled up to 4K uh, in Unreal, and uh, gives you just a lot of different scenes to to choose from. This is using a bunch of mega scans uh, uh, meshes, and I literally there's no landscape in this one. Actually, there's this it's is just literally rocks. just mega scans rocks, just all dragged together uh, into a scene. Um, That's killer. Yeah, and, and this is actually something that Unreal Engine Five will be really good um, for doing. Um, this particular one was done in Unreal Engine Five using Nanite, um, and Nan Nanite basically allows you to add multiple instances of any given static mesh at no performance cost. So you could add like 10,000 of the same rock and it will have the same performance as adding only one of those rocks. Um, you know, even though it, you're just filling the, the scene with like tons of meshes, it, it has no performance uh, cost to that. Um, I've found that Unreal Engine 5 is like, Pretty good for most of the things I, I need to do right now, but there there are like kind of some weird things in it that like aren't complete. So I wouldn't recommend it for like actual yeah. like production stuff. But. Still on pre-release. Um, yeah. But they're they're doing interesting stuff with it. The um, they did. A, I don't know if everyone saw this, but there was like a procedurally generated uh, city that they shot a like virtual matrix mm -hmm. action kind of scene with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I watched that. Yeah, it was pretty um, cool. They also just released another like uh, um, meta meta human creator sort of thing, um, but it's like still pre-release where you can procedurally generate 
people, um, but it's all online and it's really buggy and crashes and you only can do it for like an hour at a time. Um, but I've been doing, I've been trying to try it out, but it's, you know, it's not there yet, but um, it's cool. Cool things are coming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lumen as well, which is their like new, like lighting system is, is really, really nice. Um, I, I do find like by default for some reason, and I haven't really figured out exactly what's different. Um, by default, scenes in Unreal Engine 5 just look better than Unreal Engine 4, even with the same exact project. Um, and yeah, I'm not, not exactly sure what, what it is that they're doing differently. Even with, with Lumen disabled and all that stuff, it still looks better in Unreal Engine 5. Um, I, th I think it might be their dynamic like resolution uh, or like super sampling or something like that uh, as contributing to it, um, which is basically, I don't know if you guys heard of, um, God, what is it called? I can't think of it. I don't know. Some, yeah, some proprietary you, NVIDIA thing. Um, Maybe you think after talking for two and a half hours. So. Yeah, yeah, Got yeah. <laughs> But cool. That was that was really cool to see how you do that and kind of go through that. And uh, it's like a testament to your artistry that I like how well you can do that. Because um, mine well, certainly didn't thank, didn't thank look you. like yours. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not just the robots doing it. We won't be replaced anytime soon. You know. But it's yeah. It was, we really I really enjoyed it. So thank you for for taking the time to put it together. Yeah. Thank you. I'm trying to I'm trying to replace myself with a robot. I'm trying to figure out how to do this hands off to where I can like like just output like a bunch of Gaia things and then just like open up a project Unreal and it'll just auto populate everything for it. Um, there are some other features in there like that I didn't go into, but you can do procedural uh, foliage placement as well. There's a, if you go into the project settings, you can enable procedural foliage and um, they have a, another actor that you can drag in called the procedural foliage spawner. It's literally another box. You just manipulate the size of the box and you drag in some trees into the thing and then you hit simulate and it just <laughs> fills in the tree. So you could, you could literally do an entire level with a click of a button in terms of the tree placement uh and it, it doesn't need to be trees you could do, do any static mesh you can you can turn into a foliage type um so if you want to do rocks pebbles sticks twigs anything that you find out you know yeah yeah um and uh just throw it into the procedural foliage spawner spawner drag that to the extents of your map and hit re-simulate and then it'll just fill it in for you um so yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. There's there's a lot that it can do. Um, it, it it's such a Unreal Engine is is uh, the more I use it, the I feel like it, it there's like always another thing that you can do with it. It just it's it's huge as a as a program. It's crazy. Yeah, like I didn't even get into any of the programming side of of what you can do sure. with blueprints or C plus plus. Like didn't you, didn't have to touch it, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, pretty cool stuff. Nice. Well, thank you, Ian. Uh, yeah, this, I, this is a really awesome tutorial. And uh, thank you for spending the time to put it together and presenting it. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much. I, yeah, I hope, it, I, I hope it, it was, uh, you know, reasonable to follow along. Uh, yeah, so. I, I, I mean, that was great. OK, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't know, Tony, did you? Was it, do you, were you able to follow along a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I, I even got some trees in um, and then tried to re uh, uh, start with the water thing, and that's where things went awry. But up to that point, I was <laughs> in a good spot. So, yeah, really yeah, good. My water, water is getting placed in the sky. So, that's why my questions were about the, the grid thing. So, I don't know. I'll figure uh, that out. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, there, um, get a card, uh, RTX card. Mine doesn't have RTX. It's just a regular graphics card. Th that that scene, the scene that we created, didn't didn't have to use any sort of real. We didn't. I didn't have it enabled. There's no real time ray tracing or anything. But um, yeah, uh, if you do get a card, um, I, I do know that NVIDIA cards like tend to be slightly better for Unreal Engine. I don't know why. Um, they're more 
they're more tightly integrated. It, it works with the the end display is a NVIDIA technology, especially mm -hmm. for virtual production. So they they work well together. That's, yeah. that's what they do. I mean, they have a good relationship with each other. Yeah, I still don't know how on earth you can get a graphics card these days. It seems impossible. Like uh, yeah, yeah, secondhand yeah. from a Bitcoin rig. Or, or if you if you buy it from a, um like like a system directly from a like a manufacturer like MSI or Alienware, it's like you can get like a 30, 3080 or whatever um at more or less cost if you are buying a whole system a whole system yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, the that's probably the way to do it are that kind of the hard ones but uh, yeah i feel like everyone i've talked to recently that it's gotten like a upgraded card and it's just like a yeah. holding system honestly though like usually like lifetime on a computer system you pretty much have to replace everything anyway because like the pci bus is going to be different on the you know, it's like you're gonna have to get a new motherboard if you want to get like a 3880 if you've had your computer for like six years or something like that. So you know, you pretty much have to buy a new system anyway. Yeah. Get to get to buy a new system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a tool. It's a tool, right? Honestly, I feel like computers like the it's like the best thing you can spend your money on. Like people run their businesses on it. Yeah, I've been. Like I, I kind of moved out every, like every, everything kind of related to my business to like work remotely and like like right now I like I'm at home but I have uh, like so Parsec that was a that was a piece of, like a kind of a streaming technology that Ian also introduced me to that um, so but I have like a desk like I basically have my workstation at the office opened up and it it's really responsive like I'm basically using it as almost like as if I was there and it like looks almost as good and. Yeah, I actually did my whole presentation on Parsec. So uh, if you guys don't know, Parsec's just a remote desktop uh, software. So I'm presenting on my MacBook, um, but there's a couple things that like Gaia doesn't run on the MacBook. So uh, I needed to use a Windows computer. So I'm running it remotely via Parsec. Um, and I actually think, Scott, um, that might be something to keep in mind for future presentations if they're going to use Unreal Engine. Um, because I think it's easier for Zoom yeah. to, to, to share a Parsec window than it is to share the Unreal Engine window directly. Yeah, because yeah. um, yeah, at the last meeting I was trying to show, when I was dragging in that photogrammetry stuff, um, I was trying to do all that, I think, from this laptop that I have doing now. And it, yeah, and it, it was like it totally crapped out. Like Zoom and Unreal Engine were like fighting for the same, I think, video resources, and they just... Yeah, so, so that might be something to keep in mind for the future. Yeah, uh, well, maybe we can, as we do, as we do more of these, we'll we'll try to like, yeah, get a little bit better at that. Um, so speaking of next month, so these meetings are monthly, um, as hopefully most of you are aware. First Tuesdays of the month. Um, next month, the well, the suggested topic that we were going to do is camera tracking. So kind of getting into more of the some of the different methods, hopefully be able to show kind of like at an indie level, what like say Vive tracker, like camera tracking might look like all the way up to like a higher end system. So um, um, the goal for next month is to start putting together a panel. I'd like to grab just a couple of people from some of the different camera types of camera tracking companies, um, just so that we can kind of hear from a couple of different manufacturers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so hopefully we'll have a, like a little kind of a mix of like sort of, um, an invited panel along with, hopefully they'll be able to demo some of the, the pros and cons of some of the different camera tracking solutions for virtual production. Um, and that'll help kind of integrate this virtual sets that we can build along with sort of the real world stuff. So that is the planned topic for February. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye.